jump into Romans. Father, thanks for the opportunity to be together. It's such a lovely day this evening. We're grateful for the time that we could spend outside and the time that we could spend uh, just enjoying uh, creation and the ways that you move the seasons along. We pray that you'd help us as we open your word tonight to revel in the good that you've done for us, the things that you tell us here in this passage should move us and stir us, and we pray that that would be the case as we look into these things and talk about the good work that you've done for us, and uh, we marvel at your grace, and we, we pray that our time together tonight would be fruitful, that you would bear fruit in us and through us, that you would move us and stir us and challenge us to live as your children, faithfully bearing your image, faithfully uh, proclaiming your gospel. So help us to know how to do that well. Help us to encourage one another and uh, share our lives together tonight uh, as we talk and spend time together around your word. Uh, Again, we thank you uh, for the time that we have to share. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's get into Romans 8. Uh, tonight we uh, finished up a couple of weeks ago in Romans eight four, and we'll get a running start. Uh, I'd like to potentially press through verse eleven. We'll see how we do. Um, let's just read those verses. How about Romans eight one to eleven to get started? We'll see how we do. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit." For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So, flowing out of verse 1, where we get this wondrous statement about there being no condemnation for us who are united to Jesus Christ in the Messiah, in Jesus, there's no condemnation for us, none to be feared in the future, none really hanging over our heads right now. And then he's seeking to explain that, flesh out how it happened, what the implications are, and what that really looks like in life through the rest of this passage. So he explains how uh, the reason, the way that this came about is he set us free. He set us free from our slavery to the law of sin and death. And the Spirit of God is the active agent there who has achieved our freedom in our experience. And he did that based on what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. God did what the law couldn't do because human flesh approaching God's law or being confronted by God's law can't deal with that in an appropriate way. And so God sent his son to serve as the sin offering, the purification offering, the sacrifice that would deal with the sin problem and all that it entailed. And that's why we can have no condemnation for us because God condemned sin in Jesus' body on the cross. The result of that, the outworking of that is in verse 4, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We talked about how Paul uh, 
explains that righteous requirement in other places and the fulfilling of the law in terms of love. Love for neighbor in particular is the way that that looks. And so that is being fulfilled in us who are in Christ Jesus as we live our lives, as we relate to each other, as we seek to love one another. That's how it's being fulfilled. But notice that it's God who's the active agent here. He's the one who's empowering us, enabling us to actually live out the righteous requirement of the law in our experience. And he begins to tease that out, and we see pretty clearly that that is the focus, not just our righteous status, but our actual lived-out righteousness, because he introduces the metaphor of walking at the end of verse 4. Walking has to do with a journey, right? There's forward movement. You're not standing still. You're not laying on the ground dead anymore. You're walking. You're moving forward in the right direction. It's a metaphor for daily living, practical, ongoing, daily life. But he gives two alternatives here. It's not those who walk according to the flesh who fulfill the law or have the law fulfilled in them, it is those who walk according to the Spirit. And so he gives us this sharp polar opposites, this dichotomy that sets us up for flesh versus the Spirit and that conflict. And we've talked about that and kicked it around uh, to set up for this so that we don't have to necessarily spend a lot of time laying the groundwork. But living according to the flesh, as will become clear, that's the life of the non-believer. That's not the life of the Christian, okay? And what we can see from this passage, and Galatians especially, is that a Christian can indeed act in ways that line up with the desires of the flesh. But that is not our settled lifestyle. That is not our walk. That is an aberration. That is where we take a step in the wrong direction. That happens for Christians. But the way he's characterizing this is our normal, steady state, Uh, experience living as a Christian depicted as going on this journey that keeps moving forward along the way, and it is according to the Spirit. Now, he's going to explain what does that look like exactly? How does that have to do Uh, in our daily daily experience? That's what verse 5 is beginning to explain to us. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Okay, so He starts by saying there's a certain mindset, a thought pattern, more directly that this has to do with our thinking, but it has to do with, uh, there's an intentionality here. There's an alignment, an agreement with the flesh that's going on. So the idea is that we, we, people who live according to the flesh are turning their minds, their attention, their focus in agreement with the flesh aligning themselves with the flesh. And notice that this is not in the language of a command or uh, a future statement. This is the reality he's describing. Those who live according to the flesh do this. This is their life. They set their minds. They have their allegiance to the things of the flesh. And this is probably in line with the language that he uses in Galatians 5 of the desires of the flesh. So that the flesh, this kind of entity that's connected to the world under the enslavement of Satan, is it wants you to act in certain ways. It wants people, human beings, to do certain things. It desires certain things for a person. And here, the person who lives according to the flesh is a cult. They're... they're a, culpable in this. They're willing in their slavery. They line themselves up with some intentionality. They want to go the direction of the flesh. And so they're actively participating, um, cooperating with the flesh. The flip side is true for us. For those who are in Christ, now he's using the language of, again, living according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. So here, the same thing is true. This is, there's our will involved. We act in certain ways. We align ourselves with the things of the Spirit. And that would be probably along the lines of Galatians 5 and the fruit of the Spirit. The reality that thinking about the fruit-bearing metaphor... 
The Spirit is the powerful agent that ensures fruit happens, but we have a responsibility to cultivate that fruit, to be involved in the process. So all of those things that are listed in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all the rest, we have a responsibility to move into those things. It's not automatic. The Spirit doesn't live inside of us and flip a switch and make us loving people. That's not how it works. Instead, He works inside of us to enable us to move in that direction, to walk in that direction, to take steps, to be loving. There's an intentionality that's required. There's cultivation that goes on. And so this mindset, again, it starts here. This is a biblical pattern, okay? How do you live your life? How do you end up doing the things that you do? Biblically speaking, it starts up here in the mind with a thought or an intention, and it moves down here to the affections. You feel something that moves you to an action, and then it goes out to the hand. So the head, the heart, and the hands. Biblically, by God's design, it's supposed to be the head rules the heart, and the heart then moves out into the hands. But we humans get it all twisted up. And we act on impulse. We act on our feelings. We allow our feelings to over, overshadow our thinking and our logic and our intentionality and our motives get all blended up. But there is a biblical pattern here that starts with the mindset and the thought patterns. And so that's why when we come to Romans 12 and he gets the big therefore about our practical implications, it starts with the renewal of our minds. First and foremost, your mind must be removed, re renewed. Your thinking must be changed so that then your heart and your affections go in the right direction. But, but again, there's an intentionality in all of that. We have a responsibility, and that's what Paul's pushing on here, even as he highlights the role of the Holy Spirit, who is the one who makes our efforts successful. He is the one who enables us to be successful in doing good, good deeds, Pleasing God is the language that he's going to go to here in just a moment. And so this is the characteristic life of a Christian. That's the way to look at verse uh, 5, the second half. Those who live according to the Spirit, the normal Christian life, is a life where I, as a Christian, set my mind, align my thinking with the things of the Spirit. Now, the things of the Spirit is probably broader than just the nine fruit of the Spirit that are listed in Galatians 5. Surely that's not an exhaustive list of the character qualities that the Spirit produces in a Christian. The things of the Spirit are, are just a broad brush reality of the things that the Spirit wants to produce in our lives. All those nine character qualities in Galatians 5 are just a representative sample. But look everywhere as to what does the New Testament require of you as a Christian. What does God command you to do as a Christian? There are lots of things, and the way to get there is first and foremost, on your side at least, on my side, what my responsibility is, is first of all to align my thinking with those things, to say, that's the life that I want to live. That's the life that I want to embody. Those are the character qualities that I want to see in my life. And that's the beginning of my responsibility as a Christian is to say, that's the right way to go. I need to agree with God. I need to agree with His perspective on what is right and good in the life of a human being united to Jesus Christ. And so here it's the things of the Spirit is the way that he spells this out. But he wants to go further. He wants to make sure that we understand the, the logic behind all of this, the reasoning. Why is it this way? Why is it true that those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the, on the things of the flesh? And why is that such a bad thing? Why do we not want to do that? Verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death. Okay, that's bad. Let's just put the bad thing out up front here. Setting the mind on the flesh. People whose mindset, whose orientation in life is toward the things of the flesh are going to die. Everything that their life is oriented around is leading to death. It's resulting in death. He's going to explain why that's true in just a second. But here he just lays out the stark fact that flesh is lined up with death. Flesh is an agent of death. Okay, it's 
not something you want to bring into the Christian experience. It's something that's out there as a part of those powers that used to keep us enslaved, that we've been set free from. Our flesh, our connection to this reality has been severed, crucified. It's the language that Paul has used and we've looked at before. And so here, he starts by saying the mindset of the flesh, the mindset on the flesh, this mental orientation, this alignment with the things of the flesh is death. He just says it so starkly. It is death. It's the embodiment of death, if you will. If you see somebody who's lining up their life with the flesh, you see a dead person. You see a person who is still under the bondage of death. That's what's being depicted there. Well, the opposite, but to set the mind on the spirit then is life and peace. Not just life. Now he's bridging his argument here because he's going to talk about um, the opposite of peace in the next verse. But he wants to bridge this. It's not just life. It's not just eternal life. That's great. <laughs> but it's important that we see that eternal life is about peace. And it's at this point we've got to back up and make sure that we don't misunderstand that word peace. That word peace in the Bible almost never, if ever, refers to a feeling of contentment or tranquility. That's the way we tend to think about it first and foremost. If it ever means that, it's only a byproduct of what we're really talking about here. And I'll show you from the context that this is true definitely in this case. But the word peace here refers to absence of conflict, absence of hostility, that we are at peace with God. That's the peace he's talking about here. To set the mind on the Spirit, on the things of the Spirit... When you do that, it shows evidence that you have eternal life, which means that you are at peace with God. It's not about how you feel. It's not about a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's not about a feeling of tranquility. That may be there sometimes and sometimes not. But that's not what he's talking about. Maybe ever in the Bible. We've got to retrain our minds that when we read the Scriptures, when we read the word peace in particular, our first thought needs to be absence of conflict, either with other people or, most of the time, with God. Sometimes both. Now, sometimes that's gonna, there, there is going to be a feeling of peace that comes out of that, but it's always a byproduct. It's always secondary, if it's there at all. And so we have to be careful that we don't misunderstand what's being described here. He's not saying that the Spirit-directed life is a life that always feels warm and fuzzy and peaceful and calm. It doesn't. We're at war. We're in conflict. It makes sense that we wouldn't feel at peace all the time, that we would have difficulty making decisions sometimes. That's the normal Christian life. We'll talk more about this probably in a couple of weeks when we talk about the language of being led by the Spirit that comes up later in this passage. But this idea of of, of a calm feeling that's a part of the Christian life, it's good when you have it. I'm glad when I feel that way, but I don't all the time. And that's normal. The Bible doesn't give us an expectation that we should feel that way. In fact, there are many scenarios in the Christian life where we definitely shouldn't feel peace. We are pressured. We are experiencing persecution and opposition. We shouldn't feel peaceful about that. We are at war. Yes, we rest in God and God's grace, but that doesn't always translate into an emotional experience of tranquility. Sometimes it does, and for some people it does. But that's no indicator of God's presence, God's doing in your life necessarily. It's just a feeling. Let it be a feeling and enjoy it while you got it. (laughs) But don't look for it or expect it or think you have to have it before you make a decision that honors God. We'll come back to that later on. But here we're talking about peace with God for sure. And the reason that I know that is the next verse. What does he contrast this with? Again, he's doing this flesh-spirit contrast here. Verse 7. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So there's the contrast. Talked about peace, and for those who are in the flesh, it's hostility. It's actually a noun here, not an adjective like our Bible translations typically have it. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostility to God. Yes, that translates to it's hostile to God, but it is the very embodiment of enmity, opposition against God. That's why we have to put the flesh reality on the 
outside. We have to put it over here in the realm of that which is still enslaved to Satan, sin, and death. They're the enemies of God. And God is their enemy. There's hostility. There's warfare between the person in the flesh, the person living according to the flesh, the person whose mindset on the flesh, and God. Hostility against God. It may not look like it. There's a lot of people who are at war with God and they're good people. They're doing good things. One of them was named Saul of Tarsus who went out and killed people for God. He was an enemy of God, thought he was serving God. doesn't always look the same in every individual life, but Paul is telling us the truth about this reality. The mind that is set on the flesh is death in verse 6, and here it's hostility to God because that's what it means to be dead, is to be alienated from God, to be at war with God, to be against God. You're dead. When you have fellowship with God, when you're at peace with God, you have life. You're not living in the realm of death anymore. You're not dominated by death. You are not dead. You are alive. That's what it means to be alive, is to have peace with God, to be in a reconciled relationship with Him. Those who live according to the flesh are not and do not and cannot. That's what he explains now. The mind that is set on the flesh is hostility to God, the very embodiment of enmity, opposition against God. Why? Or how do you know? For it does not submit to God's law. The mind that is set on the flesh, or the things of the flesh, that's oriented, aligned with the things of the flesh, doesn't submit to God. There he just states it as a bare fact. They don't. They don't submit to God. No matter what their actions look like, they don't submit to God's law. When they're confronted with God's law, they don't bend the knee. They don't bow to it and say, yes, Lord. They are in rebellion against it. And then he adds, to ground that, if we were wondering, well, why don't they submit to God's law? Indeed, he says, it cannot. It is not able. It does not have the ability to do so. And then he elaborates on that statement as well in verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Suddenly we're in a much larger category than just submitting to God's law specifically. Now we're in a bigger category of opposition against God. It's not just that when a person who's in the flesh is confronted by God's law that they can't obey those specific commandments. That's true, but it's bigger than that. They can't do anything that pleases God. That's the fundamental problem with fallen humanity. Everything else falls under that umbrella. We talked about this a while back. When we think about the doctrine of total depravity, this is the most important aspect of that. It's not that people are as bad as they could be. By God's grace, no one is as bad as they could be. But the truth of the matter is, for every human being on the face of the planet, there is a fundamental inability to please God. And when you start thinking through, well, what pleases God? What kinds of things please God? And then you just go through that list. You could actually do an effective Bible study on that. I've done it. You'd be surprised... I was surprised how much the Bible says about what it looks like to please God. And I was particularly surprised at how much it says about our deeds, our deeds, pleasing God. There's a lot there to see. And when you start looking at that, every time you see something where the Bible says, this pleases God, and then you say, someone in the flesh can't do that. They do not have the ability to do that you start recognizing the real mess that human beings are in and the real impossibility of salvation. And I want that to hang there. It is impossible. Salvation is impossible. Completely impossible. It requires a miracle every single time. And this is why. Humans cannot get there. They don't have the ability to For example, trust Jesus. When they're offered eternal life in the gospel, they don't have the ability to say, yes, I want that. They don't have the ability to believe the truth of Scripture. They don't have the ability to follow Jesus. 
They don't have the ability to honor God with their lives. They don't have the ability to submit to discipleship. Unable. So, what has to happen? They got to get able. (laughs) How do they get able? Well, God's got to do something. God's got to grant an ability. He's got to give a gift. He's got to move in first. His power, His Spirit has to give life, which then creates an ability to respond, to please God. We can't please God without any of those things as long as we remain in the flesh. So according to what he's saying here, for someone to please God, they've got to get out of the flesh. They've got to get in the Spirit. Well, how does that happen? Well... God does it. (laughs) Born again by the Spirit. Life given by the Spirit. That has to come before anybody can please God with faith or repentance and everything else that flows out of that. Anything that pleases God. The only person on the planet who has ever pleased God in and of himself is Jesus. Good. He said it of himself, and he knew it of himself. I always do what is pleasing to my Father. Always. That's not us. That's not human beings outside of Christ. But that's where Paul turns now in verse 9. He's not talking to people in the flesh. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to people in Christ. So verse 9, you, however... Not in the flesh. Just let that hang for just a minute. You're not in the flesh. Whatever you want to say about the flesh, whatever struggle we still have against the desires of the flesh that's really there, you are not in the flesh. And so this mindset of the flesh, you don't have it. You don't have it. Now you can and you do at times move in that direction. We all do. But that's not the same thing. People who are in the flesh cannot please God. You're not in the flesh. You can please God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what makes the difference here. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, and again, why does he even say this? He's writing to the church in Rome. Why does he say this? You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact... The Spirit of God dwells in you. Why does he say it like that? Well, he knows what a church is. And he knows that a church in Rome, any given local church, is going to have people in it who may in fact not be in the Spirit, in whom the Spirit does not indwell. And so he's writing and he says, if indeed, so that every single one of us will ask the question, is he? Does he? Does he dwell in me? And hopefully we will see evidence to answer, He is. And that's where he goes in the later sections here, which we won't get to tonight, talking about what kinds of things does the Spirit do. And he's not going to list everything out in this passage, the things that the Spirit does in in the life of a believer, but he gives us some really important ones, both objective and subjective. But we will come back to that Probably next week in part. Um, Before we get there, we need to flesh this out a little bit. And I do just want to look at these verses 9 through 11 here to fit together. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the topic, essentially, that we're talking about here. But we need to see what, what that looks like and what he's saying here. You're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ, remember, Christ is Messiah. This is the Spirit of the Messiah. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of the Messiah does not belong to Him. Doesn't belong to the Messiah. Not one of the Messiah's people. This is the key distinctive presence of the Holy Spirit. In a person. If you don't have him, you're not in Christ. 
and not a follower of Jesus. The Spirit makes all the difference. Now, I want to pull on that little word have for just a minute. It seems like a strange thing to think about, but I want to slow us down a little bit and make sure we understand what we're talking about here. We have a tendency when we use the word has, have, had in English and in Greek is flexible. I wonder if you realize just how flexible it is just in English. Think about the ways you use the word have. I think by default, we think of uh, I have a home or a house. I, I, I'm talking about a possession. I'm talking about ownership of a thing. That's, I don't think that works right here. Because we recognize that the spirit is not a thing or a power or a force, right? Uh-huh. Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He is a person, not a thing, not an object, not a mystical power, not some force that we control, possess, or manipulate. So what else do we do? Well, we say, I could say something like, I have a cold. Now, a cold is not a thing, especially. It kind of is, but it's shorthand, right? If I say I have a cold, that's shorthand that says... There is a virus living in my body. And I'm really, what I'm really saying, I'm not usually thinking about that. When I say I have a cold, I'm saying I am experiencing symptoms of this cold virus. And that language of experience is important. And it fits somewhat here. And we can think about it, I have a cold, a virus living inside of me. I don't think the Ancients would have thought of it that way necessarily, but that works, right? Because the emphasis in this passage is the presence of the Spirit in me. It's not that He lives with me in my house like we share, a room, we're roommates. No, He's in me. That's even better than roommate living. <laughs> if you've ever had one, you know that it's not always that great. But He inhabits my very person. He's inside of me. So I could say, I have a virus. Or... I could say, and do say, I have a wife. Neither of those two other ways we've just been talking about it works exactly really well. I certainly don't intend to say that my wife is a, a possession that I own, like I have a house. I have a wife doesn't mean I own her, per se. And it's not that she's inside of me, like a virus, and certainly not the negative connotations <laughs> of a virus. Um, but when I say I have a wife, or I have a daughter, or I have a father, or I have an aunt, or I have a cousin, what I mean is I have a relationship with a person that is the relationship of wifeness, <laughs> or cousinness, or something. <laughs> I have is shorthand in English for I have a relationship with a person. I think that's what we're supposed to understand here. The Greek is that flexible as well. Has, have, had, and English is a good equivalent to the Greek verb echo that has the same kind of flexibility. It's used for people having a condition. So when, someone, when you read in the Bible of someone saying, I have an illness or he has an illness of some kind, it's the same kind of idea. They recognize he's... There's something wrong with him. He's, have, he's either experiencing symptoms or they recognize he has some disease or the language of a person having a demon, for example, in the Gospels. He had a demon. What? Do, what, what? Either, that, that means they see he's having symptoms caused by a demon, very much like we would think of a virus causing symptoms, or they recognize there's a demon living inside of him. And so it is that the Spirit lives inside of us. But it's more than that. Because it's not just that His presence is here as though He's inhabiting our bodies and we're suddenly a robot and He controls us. That's not the case. But instead, He lives inside of us and He interacts with us. We'll see that in the later part of this passage, the second half picking up in well, even, even before we get to the second half of the chapter, but into, down into verses 16 and 17, when he bears witness, testifies with our spirit or to our spirit, there's an interaction going on. That's a relational reality. The spirit 
I have the Spirit means I have a relationship with Him. But notice particularly the way that this is said. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Messiah. That's important. You see, the Spirit's role here is, in a sense, to connect me to Jesus. Specifically. Now, there's a reality that I have with the Spirit Himself, but it's not independent of Jesus. In fact, the Spirit, when Jesus talked about the sending of the Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, He told the disciples, I'm going to send Him, and His job is to testify of Me. The most important function of the Holy Spirit is to point to Jesus, not to Himself. And I think that's very important for Christians to grasp because we can get too hung up on thinking about the Holy Spirit. Now, we need to find balance in there because this chapter is primarily about the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about Him a lot for the next few weeks. And that's a good thing. We need to think biblically about the Spirit and allow the Scriptures to shape our understanding of the experiences that we have that are connected to the Holy Spirit according to the Scriptures. Scriptures must guide us here. Because there's too many ways for us to either fake it, pretend, or to be deceived by other spirits. And I'm not talking about necessarily a demon inside of you, because if you're a Christian, that's not a thing. But an external reality so that a deceiver could convince you that something is going on in your life that's driven by the Spirit. And you could say, oh, it is. And it becomes this new f- experience that you want to tout and elevate. We'll talk more about that later on. But it's important that we start here. In fact, Romans 8 has been, throughout church history, identified as the chapter that's about the Holy Spirit. If you want to go learn about the Holy Spirit, the first place to go is Romans chapter 8. And then you go from there. Typically, we start in places like 1 Corinthians 12 to 14, spiritual gifts passage. And I think we get confused by prioritizing certain things in ways that get things out of kilter. But we'll come back to those realities later on. So here, just talking about the language of have, (laughs) don't race over that language so quickly. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of the Messiah does not belong to Him. Hasn't been purchased by Him. That's Owned by Jesus here means purchased by Him in His death. Verse 10, but if Christ... now, Now he's just talking about the Messiah. If the Messiah is in you, so somehow, in some way, we're to understand that the Spirit's presence in me as a believer is so connecting me to Jesus, the Messiah, who is physically in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God right now. That's where He is physically right now. But because of His connection with the Holy Spirit, where the Spirit goes, the Father and the Son are as well. So when the Spirit is living in me, then that means the Messiah is living in me. And that becomes the root and the ground for our identity. We are united to Jesus, and the Spirit is the one who holds that union together. So much so that I am an ambassador of the Messiah. I am a representative of the Messiah in this world because He's living in me. He he didn't just send us out into the world. He goes with us. Remember the Great Commission and how it ends? I am with you always even to the end of the age. This is what that means. He is with us, not just in a, oh, if, I'm, if I said, I'm going with you and I, in spirit, and it just means I'm you know, back home praying for you, or I'm kind of checking up on you online to see how things are going. No, no, no. He's actually with you wherever you go, 24-7, 365 days a year, every moment of every day. Jesus is with you. In you, even. Not in the passenger seat of your car. In the very throne of your heart, to use a metaphor. 
But if Messiah is in you, here's the payoff that Paul wants to focus on. There's lots of payoff, but here's the one he wants to focus on right here. Although the body is dead because of sin, so he acknowledges the reality that this this body hasn't been fixed yet, and that becomes the second half of Romans 8 becomes, well, what about that? We recognize there's something still wrong with me here. This body it doesn't work right. I still sin. It breaks down, and I'm going to die unless Jesus returns first. My body is going to be laid in a casket at some point, or burned, or destroyed. That's no good. <laughs> And Paul acknowledges that that reality has not been fixed yet, has not been repaired yet. And it's because of sin. Even though that's the case, the Spirit is life. Now, some of your Bible translations will say the Spirit is alive. But Paul is more forceful here than just to say the Spirit is alive. And some of your Bible translations might even lowercase, have a lowercase s there where he's talking about the human spirit. But no, this passage is about the Holy Spirit. And he'll make a distinction between the Holy Spirit and our spirit in a little while in the next paragraph. But here, I'm pretty confident that he's talking about the Holy Spirit is life. And that reality is he is the very embodiment of life so that even though my body will die, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit in me, I will not die. My life is preserved even as my body dies. Isn't that what Jesus told Mary and Martha after or before he raised Lazarus from the dead? If anyone believes in me, even though he die, so shall he live. The Spirit is life because of righteousness. Huh, because of righteousness. The body is dead. The body is going to die because of sin. But here, the, the uh, spirit is life because of righteousness. What, is, what does he mean? He could mean several things. But with the emphasis here on the character and the outworking of the life, the walk, that we are to live, the righteous life that we are to be living and that we've already read back in verse 4 that God is fulfilling in us the righteous requirement of the law as we walk according to the Spirit. I think what we're to see in this because of righteousness, He's showing us the evidence that we have the Spirit who produces life. He's producing life and that looks like righteousness, righteous living. Not perfect righteousness, you have to look to Jesus for that, but real righteousness, genuine righteous deeds, genuine be, having the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in you so that you love your neighbor as yourself, at least at times, inconsistently, imperfectly, but truly and really. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, so note the Trinitarian language right there just in that phrase, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, well, who's that? Well, that's the Father. The spirit of the Father who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised the Messiah, Jesus, from the dead, so again, the Father here, God, will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you now. So the Spirit dwells in you now, and that is the guarantee. That's the language Paul uses over in Ephesians 1 and in a couple of other places. He is the guarantee of this future promise that even though your body's going to die right now, your mortal body, this very body that's dying, decaying, frustrating, and stupid, is going to get changed. But it's this body. You're not going to get a brand new body. I mean, you are, it's going to be a, but it's going to be a radically renovated body that has your name on it, that is the same as your body. So you're not going to get somebody else's body, that's the point. You're going to get your body radically transformed by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the change agent. That's the way to think about the Holy Spirit. First and foremost, He is the one who brings about transformation in the life of the Christian. And it starts the moment you begin to trust in Jesus, but that Initial transformation is internal. 
It's Him changing our character. And it's progressive. It's the things that He does in our character, in our lives, enabling us to please God, enabling us to honor God with our words, with our actions, with our attitudes, throughout our lives. But all of that is the evidence that the real, ultimate, full, and final transformation is guaranteed to come in the future. That's Paul's logic here. You see evidence of the Spirit at work in your life. You can grab hold of this promise and know for sure that on the last day, your body will be radically transformed. There will be no more sin. There will be no more fleshly desires. There will be no more brokenness or weakness. It will all be gone. And the guarantee is based on what Jesus has done, that he has, what God has done in raising Jesus from the dead. Right? We look back to that Easter event. And because he was raised from the dead bodily, we have the guarantee that our resurrection will follow suit, since he is indeed the first fruits of the resurrection. The guarantee of what is to come in the future. So let's stop there, and I'll take a couple of questions. We're out of time, essentially. Charlie? Um, so, verse 10 and verse 11 are really connected by virtue of um, the righteousness. In other words, uh, we can sort of look at verse 11 as um, uh, even now, but not yet, but mm -hmm. we, we should be able, and other people looking at us, should be able Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think that's the way verses 10 and 11 work, essentially. And you see that in other places in this passage as well. Yeah. Ed? So am I to assume that my animated body is no true indication of life? Your animated body... Just because I'm talking and blinking... Yeah, that mean I'm alive. that's right. Yes. I mean, there's got to be something way more than that, because otherwise, I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me to talk in those terms. Yeah, so the Spirit is life. Again, it's more it's stronger than just being that alive, the adjective there. It's the Spirit is life, and life is not just there's air coming through your nostrils and your heart's beating and you've got blood pumping through your veins. Life is righteousness, ultimately. That is life. Hmm. So, at one level, I want to make it less complicated than that. And at the other hand, you're right. On the other hand, you're right. It is much bigger. So, just to inch toward an answer, take the phrase life and peace from back in verse 6. And remember that not... Peace is not just absence of hostility, but it's also the presence of wholeness. So shalom is the Hebrew background here, and certainly Paul has that in mind. So it's not just that I'm no longer an enemy with God, but now I am his friend, and being his friend means that I get all the benefits of friendship with God, which means wholeness, re reconciliation with God, and a new ability to please God, and ultimately this promise of resurrection comes there too, so that all of the things that hamper me now will be gone, guaranteed. They're not gone yet. So there's a not yet piece of this that's incomplete. Okay, yeah, I heard from the hymn on Sunday, this one line, is anyone whole? Mm, yeah. That yes. <laughs> that's where we're getting at, yes. Wholeness aspect of holiness, I suppose, but wholeness. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Well, let's call it a night. Go to discussion groups, and then uh, we'll pick up there and do some other things next time. Verse 12.